Um, I'm going to edit it and I'm going to show you if you're fine with the narrative again. And uh, then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to lose subscribers. Sure. I mean, this one's going to be like, woof. Like, we're, we're touching the third rail on this one. I'm excited. I like this. Welcome back to Miniature Painting Myth Busting. My name is Chris, probably better known as Traverion, and my co-host of the show is Vincent Venturella. If you don't want to miss any of the episodes, make sure that you are subscribed to this channel, but also to Vince, because the episodes are going to alternate on a bi-weekly basis between the both channels. You can find a link in the description, and there's also going to be a link to a playlist that will be updated so that you can binge watch all of the episodes in one go. Let's face it, everyone starting with this great hobby sooner or later is going to hear these different ideas about miniature painting and without a lot of experience it's going to be hard to know which ones to believe and to take into consideration and which are just bro science and personal opinions or maybe misinformation that persisted over the years. So our goal with this show is to throw our combined influence of 40 years in the hobby and the industry at these ideas and see if we can shed some light on the origins and whether or not there is a kernel of truth to them. And all of that with the goal in mind to help newer painters with less experience to form an opinion. But most of all, we want to entertain you for 15 or 20 minutes and maybe give you another perspective on this wonderful hobby of miniature painting. I hope you're going to have fun with this episode. Let's see what it brings. Okay, so the next topic that I want to talk to you about is probably a bit of a loaded one. And the last thing that I want to, to do, and I know that you don't want that either, is to make it a tribal thing. And I also don't want people to see it as a tribal thing, because what I really enjoy is that the community, wherever we are in the world, is coming together for miniature painting and, and is enjoying it, and we're all enjoying it together. The myth that I want to propose to talk about this time is that Europe is better at miniature painting than the US. And again, this is not going to be an us versus them. That's not something neither you nor me are interested in. We want to explore where does it originate? What are the underlying events that maybe led to it? And then see where we go from there. So what's your take on that? Buried in this question is this sort of mix up of quantity and quality. And I think that would be good for us to explore. Are we saying there's more great miniature painters in Europe than in the States or in America? Or are we saying that the highest quality that, that exists within Europe is higher than what's in the States or America or both? And by the way, it should also be noted that, of course, you know, we're, we're just openly apparently discounting the rest of the world here in this, in this discussion. And that's one of the reasons I don't like this particular myth. It, see, it has this sort of uh, Euro-US view that just pretends like nobody else paints miniatures anywhere else. Like there's not great miniature painters in Australia or Korea or Japan or anywhere else in the world. Casting that and setting it to the side and just examining this myth, do I think that Europe in general produces more or better quality painters than the US? I think the answer to that is yes. I think that's honestly a true statement, okay? I have a lot of reasons for that that have nothing to do with what I think people want to pin this on. I think there's actually really logical reasons for this when you Corey, when you kind of get into the, the, the brass tacks of it, but, but we can talk through it. We can obviously not take the entirety of the US and the entirety of Europe and take everyone who paints and evaluate everyone's results and then draw a median and say, okay, this is slightly higher than the other one. So we have to focus on maybe what's the most visible, I guess. No, I agree. There's, there's no objective way to do this, but we can 
look at various data points and say, well, there's probably some kind of correlation there. I was surprised initially that Wins immediately said that the amount of pinnacle skill painters is higher in Europe than in the US. But if we look at the data that is available and that Vince is referring to here, we see that the statement has a truth there. For example, looking at the galleries at Party and Paint and Culminion Nots and sorting them by top rated artists, you see an overwhelming amount of painters from Europe in the top percentile of those lists. And that even surprised me because I never watched this too closely in the past and I had all of these talking points prepared about how art is subjective and that it is not that easy to say which piece of art is better than the other. But well, here we are looking at more or less hard facts and they are community driven. It's almost a democratic process of determining the best among your peers. So I think where this comes from as, as an American painter is just that a lot of the painting superstars whatever that means, that people tend to share and look up to and think are at sort of the pinnacle of skill tend to come from Europe. People who we think are producing work that is game-changing, mind-boggling, you know, whatever you want to say, evolutionary to the art in some way. And a lot of those would be European dominant. That's just the reality of the thing. There would be People like Richard Gray or Michael Pisarski or uh, Farabi or whatever. We can go on and on and on. So what we consider good in this uh, framework, can we say maybe instead of good, uh, it's innovative? Is that a thing? I think that can be part of it. But I think just good is also something that sort of the broader community can work out in some way through popularity it's a rough measure and it can be interfered with by that artist's own ability to you know promote themselves and such but when someone shares something and sight unseen it gets liked or reshared or whatever whatever massive number of times if you look at pinterest boards of you know inspirations for how to do this kind of thing and it's dominated by the pieces of those artists no one had any incentive to put that Pinterest board together in any way but the way that they thought best represented what they were trying to do when they wanted to make their their Space Marine inspiration board. And the fact that it happens to be dominated by a bunch of Euro painters is sort of a good metric. But again, all these times I'm going to say dominated because it's not as though it's 100%. I don't ever want to create that illusion. There is a ton of great, amazing painters in the U.S. And if you were to go skill against skill, one against one, this all kind of breaks down, right? Because there are plenty of good artists that one-to-one, -one, you're going to see amazing stuff happen. I'm only, this only works in the aggregate, I think. If we take the top painters in each region and randomly pit them one against another, there's usually a recognizable difference in style. But we cannot really say which of these is better because not only is their skill so high, it's also a creative endeavor which innately has a less tangible aspect of personal preference attached to it. That is also the reason why a lot of miniature shows use the open system which pays tribute to that and can award multiple gold medals in a category. When I think of good painters, obviously people like Sergio Carvo come to mind. And if I take someone from the US, say uh, Matt Di Pietro, how do you say which one of the two is better? Like uh, Matt has um, a more a cleaner style, I would say, really smooth blendings. Uh, doesn't mean that the rest is is worse, but that's something that he shines at. Where Sergio Calvo shines more in the um, illustrative. Um, he doesn't blend a lot. Um, he likes stark colors and all of that. So that is a different focus, right? You cannot really distinguish what is good. Uh, or better on the individual level. Right, exactly what I'm saying, yes. That when you go down to the one-to-one -one level, it's almost impossible to evaluate. Sure, if I took Matt or Jen Haley or uh, Sam Lenz or, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of American uh, miniature painters who do absolutely incredible, groundbreaking, mind-boggling work. And if I took them one-on-one -on -one against the best people who are doing stuff in, in, in Europe, 
or Australia or anywhere, who knows how it would shake out? It would depend on the individual piece, that type of competition, that whatever the, the scenario was, right? But when you look at the total, at everything, you say, this is the raw number of sort of high quality, right? So we're not looking for the number one. We're just looking to, for them to hit a certain bar where this is, they're producing high quality work, whatever that means. We can draw some imaginary line, right? And what I tend to see is that more people coming out of Europe will meet that bar than in places like the US. So why is that? In our following conversation, we realized that there is a lot of factors that influence this. Many of them you would not connect to miniature painting right away or at all. Some are at play even today and some are echoes from how painting scenes developed in the different regions. Uh, one thing that I remember because I was in it personally was the um, decade of you know early 2000s to maybe 2010. And what happened there was a um, an almost an explosion of different styles and uh, painters that were developing new styles and adding new hmm, techniques to miniature painting, or they took techniques out of uh, traditional art and they implemented it into miniature painting. And a lot of these people were from Europe. So what comes to mind is the French painters uh, that started with the senator light or just general light theory that came from, from traditional art. And then uh, they did that and <laughs> did it quite well. And then the French took that and made it their own and uh, applied something different. So I'm guessing or my explanation for that was always that it's uh, different cultures within a continent uh, in close distance that influenced each other and, and were just a bit of a breeding pool for new innovations and new ideas. No, I think you're dead on. The, so the, what you're talking about, that first decade of the 2000s, let's just call it 2001 to 2010, was such an explosion of evolution in miniature painting, right? Yeah, I mean, the French scenes, the French scene, the Spanish scene, the Italian scene, and the UK scene all underwent huge, huge, huge uh, revolutions in the way that they painted miniatures, all led by different groups of artists, right? This is also the time where there began to be Golden Demons or Games Days or whatever they called them that were happening in the individual countries in Italy or something like that. And there, so there, you can get this sort of national pride in it. I think there's a longer history in Europe of, of there being both information exchange, but also friendly competition. A lot of those people you're talking about that were making these, these steps weren't working alone, right? They had groups of artists that were there that worked together. And at the same time, the geography and the transportation of Europe is such that like, if you want to get from France to Spain, or, or something like that. It's not actually that complicated. There are lots of public transportation options that will get you there relatively efficiently. And same for kind of all the rest around Europe. You have a much more connected public transport system. So when you're starting already working with a group where every member of the group is pushing each other, and then you're working with a, against a broader group that you can go visit relatively easily, that leads to a lot more information sharing quickly. Uh, here in the States, we tend to work alone. There's a lot less groups of people actively painting together, and we're a lot more geographically separate. Uh, there's not really public transportation options for me where I am in the, in, the, in the area of the country I am. If I want to go visit some other artists that I know, it means I'm going to go get in my car and drive for 12 hours, right? And even then, I'm just going to visit one other person. It's not me and three members of my painting group getting on a train and visiting the four members of this painting group over here. So now we've got the power of eight people all talking, exchanging ideas and getting a lot of bounce back. And I think that accelerated it and has continued to, to, to be an, an advantageous thing for the people in Europe. Yeah, painting definitely has a socialization aspect. We can see that uh, all the time that there is certain groups of uh, people and sometimes you realize that exactly the two people whose miniatures look really similar are friends and the uh, influence is always there. So another aspect and that's a bit of a sub myth to the original myth. Do you think there is maybe a different focus in the US than uh, in Europe when it comes to gaming over painting? This one seems like one of those nonsense cultural explanations that just never holds water and you can't test it. I know lots of painters here 
And in doing my interview series, I know lots of painters all around the world, some who got started through gaming and then went to display, some who started doing single figures and then gamed somewhere in the middle or never gamed. All that's just a just a crapshoot, right? There's lots of ways into this this hobby. I've never bought that for a moment. If that were true, by the by, there wouldn't be a hundred new war games a year of varying niche types coming out of Europe. Like the 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 still to this day, the source of new unique war games is still like five to one Europe. Are you telling me that they're literally making all of these for for other countries and nobody on that continent wants to play it? I don't buy it for a minute. You know, I think one of the things there though sort of leading on from what I just mentioned, there are more companies producing both figures for games and figures for display in Europe than there are in the States. And the reality is those companies often have to pay artists to paint minis, to get box art, to get armies, to get whatever. Like there's a whole, there's a whole uh, economy around this because those companies want to work with people they know want to work with people that are close by that they can hold accountable when they can not necessarily go contract with somebody half a world literally away that means that those european artists have more of a chance to do box art work army painting work whatever that happens to be that then means that could be their living art can more easily be your living in europe and once art is what you're literally doing 40 hours a week 50 hours a week 60 hours a week right and that's all you have to do is paint and you're getting paid to paint for a living it would stand to reason you would improve this is not a thing that many people here in the u.s can do and i will say in the one place where i'm familiar with it happening here in the u.s which is in texas around the group with jen haley and ann and and uh, Marika Reimer and all those people where they all worked for Dark Sword and Reaper, right? Both of which are out of that Texas area. All of them became like, they all worked with each other. They were a painting group and they all are amazing painters producing amazing stuff. There's the one time I'm familiar with it really happening over here and the exact same thing resulted, right? You had a dedicated group of people who could do this more or less for a living who all then became amazing artists working with each other and producing amazing stuff. It's interesting that you mentioned Jen Healy. I mean, it's no surprise, but it's interesting because of the point that I want to make that I think that group was active before the early 2000s, before that period that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. When I think back to the research that I did when I started miniature painting, they had a lot of and the only tutorials online that you can find and really high quality stuff. And yeah, were one of the only sources to learn from. So now we have, um, you know, that group and uh, it's spilling over to, to Europe because of the internet. And a lot of European painters probably got into painting because of these tutorials. Pretty sure of that. So what we have right. here a bit is inspiration spilling over from one continent to the other. And I think what we have now is after all this incubation period uh, that we had in, in Europe, a lot of the inspiration is spilling back over to the US. And we see more and more great painters uh, coming out of the US now. Let's be honest here. We live in a, an age of democratization through things like YouTube and Patreon and, and the internet in general, right? It's very rare for any kind of knowledge that you want about miniature painting to be sequestered. Uh, it's just not a thing that happens anymore because almost every artist has a Patreon, almost every artist puts videos somewhere. You can learn from anyone you want. If you put in the hours and the practice, you can do what they're doing theoretically. I do though have one thing that I think inevitably holds the US back and it's not some cultural nonsense. Treverian, you yourself are self-employed in miniature painting. This is what you do for a living. This is your full-time job in which you invest much more than 40 hours a week, most weeks, correct? Correct. Uh, if Trevarian tomorrow, you were to break your leg, when you go to the hospital, is that still like, do you have healthcare that will take care of your broken leg? They will, definitely. That is not the case here in the States if you go down that road. For people who are going to become those sorts of self-employed artists here in the States, it usually means leaving something like healthcare behind. Maybe you can still get access to it, but even if you do, it's probably extremely expensive. 
because our healthcare is naturally tied to our employer and our employment, it's much harder for people here in the States to go full time and to just dive into that. There's a much bigger risk factor to going out alone and making this something you're doing full time that in Europe, you're largely shielded from. The social safety net of, I mean, this is not a political statement, this is just a statement of facts, like the social safety net of Europe is more extensive than the social safety net of the US. Uh, and I think that is a big thing that holds people back. Uh, I, I know many artists who don't have any kind of health care. They're just like, well, I hope I don't get sick. That's their plan. That's rough. That, it, to me, seems to explain the quantity question. At, at the very top end, when you look at quality, my guess is there's basically no difference. Or it would be impossible to tell, or it would be judged differently in five different competitions. But when you look at quantity, I think there is a measurable difference. And here's some more data points. Go to Monte San Savino. How many collections, how many individual entries are there that are all absolutely stunning, high quality works, right? There's going to be hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. Whereas when you go to in the States, even at the big competitions, it, when you sort of look at the master's category at something like Capital Palette, which is probably the biggest in the States right now, there's maybe a hundred. Nice entries. to meet you total across everything in that in that at that level of competition so that's what i say when i say just quantity and by the way it's the same for hussar salute or you know whatever you can pick your the, the various different shows in europe my understanding is that all of them produce these high numbers of high quality entries again probably because of the nature of the schooling, having it, there's probably more of a, I don't know, but my perception is European schools actually teach art more thoroughly than American schools where it's actually not an often taught subject, sadly, where people are more easily able to work in groups and share ideas with each other and travel back and forth to meet each other, where there are a lot more bigger competitions and shows people can go to and travel to easily and get inspired, where there are more paying jobs where one can be an artist and that's a real career and where it is easier to pursue that because you risk less of train wrecking your entire life. To me, when I look at those those factor of things, it would just naturally lead to more of those types of people happening. If the ecosystem's been created, more people will naturally fill the space. It's just incentives. So ultimately, there's a few factors that allow people to be able to dive a lot more into the subject and spend more time and in immerse themselves into just getting quote unquote better at this um, craft or art. And that is ultimately an explanation why the myth has a bit of a, a ring of truth to it. Exactly. That's where I think the kernel of truth lies. Mm -hmm. the, the quality always comes down to the individual. That's why I think that myth is false. It's not as though what is produced by European painters is some impossible pinnacle that can never be reached by people in the US or Australia or the uh, Pacific Rim or something like that. Many of my personal favorite miniature painters in the world are not from either Europe or the US, right? So that's just a nonsensical thing. Those come down to individuals. And like we said, it's almost impossible to evaluate at that level of quality which one is slightly above another in a creative type exercise. But I can look out at the entire pool of artists and I can make a, say, a statement about which cohort is tending to produce more higher quality work. That's, that is, seems like something we can make a broad statement about. So while this myth seems to have a grounding in reality, like we just explored. Isn't it great that so many people from all over the world can come together over a common hobby and that there is so many people out there and so much stuff to learn from any of them and just get new ideas from them. And yes, even though there are certain historic and socioeconomic effects to how different regions developed in regards to miniature painting, I think in the end, we should not focus on what divides us but everything that we have in common, like the love for painting small luxury plastic toy soldiers. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next episode. I didn't mention Eric Swinson. See, this is why I hate mentioning names. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
because like i just forgive people and then that person's going to feel bad and like eric swinson's an amazing artist i'm not meaning to like he is one of the best in the u.s right now he's awesome like i feel bad because now i left him off the list right and i just this is why i always hate naming names because you you dename a hundred people you you didn't name you know that's not what i mean i'm just forgetful you know that's going into outtakes right <laughs> that's fine eric you're great there's an outtake it's fine uh okay